very much for the uh, introduction, and I actually wanted to begin by thanking the uh, program committee and the program chairs for the invitation. Uh, it turns out I, I actually did enjoy putting together the slides and thinking about what I wanted to say in this talk, uh, though initially I do have to admit that I uh, kind of dreaded uh, you know, giving this talk, and I tried to decline, sort of, I don't know if you realize, but um, anyway, uh, they didn't let me. Uh, and why was I, in part, dreading this talk? Well, part of the difficulty is uh, exactly what uh, Daniela talked about, is deciding what to speak about, and the program chairs gave me uh, no help in that matter. Uh, <laughs> uh, they said, yeah, whatever you want to speak about is fine. Okay, great, so what's the first thing I, I thought about uh, to speak about? Is well, my, my initial thoughts turned to uh, talking about secure uh, multi-party computation. And uh, that's a really interesting topic. And the problem with that is that I really didn't want to bore half the audience. Um, usually, uh, if, I, if I can only bore about one third or one quarter of the audience, uh, that's what I aim for. So um, what, I, what I tried to think about is, well, OK, um, the idea should be that what I should talk about is maybe some connections between the theory of secure computation uh, and something. Okay, well, wh what should I connect the theory with? Well, that's kind of the obvious. Uh, I should try to connect the theory of secure computation with all the recent work going on uh, in, on the practical side of secure computation and talk about the uh, bridges that are being built uh, between these two communities. And this is uh, a great topic to talk about. Actually, in general, the intersection or the interplay between theory and practice in cryptography uh, is a great topic to talk about if I do say so myself. And uh, the problem with this is that uh, many other people have realized this, and many other people uh, have talked about this before. And in particular, uh, I went back and took a look at the uh, previous invited talks at Crypto EuroCrypt and AsiaCrypt just to get a sense of what people spoke about. And many, many people uh, have spoken about theory and practice in different guises. And, I, and I, this is my own, uh, my own opinion about whether the talk was theory and practice. Some people on the list may disagree. Um, and in particular, in 2017, and Nigel Smart, talked about secure computation theory and practice. So, OK, well, that gives me a little bit of pause. I should come up with something else. So, um, I, yeah, and I could just agree with everything he said. And, and uh, <laughs> I, I don't think he's here, actually, which is too bad. I thought he might enjoy this talk. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I could agree with everything he said and, and then end in five minutes. Uh, I will add a few thoughts of my own. Uh, but OK, I better come up with something else. So uh, what I decided to talk about instead, actually, are some, is some recent work um, connecting uh, theory and practice of secure computation with something that I hope will be of interest to uh, other people in the audience, uh, namely uh, symmetric key crypto and cryptanalysis. Uh, and we'll see how actually these communities that are usually thought of as being relatively far apart, and I think unfortunately so, um, really there, there are some nice connections between the two of them. Uh, let me just step back a little bit and spend maybe five minutes uh, talking about uh, theory and practice. Um, I should start maybe by, by giving my biases, right? So I started out, well, I started out, I guess, as a chemist, uh, so thanks for reminding everybody. Um, <laughs> my, my, but my roots as a, as a PhD a cryptographer uh, are in the theory community. And what I found, I guess, over time, and maybe many of us have this feeling, is that uh, gradually uh, over my career I became jealous of practitioners. They seem to have uh, a lot of the fun, not all the fun but they seem to have a lot of the fun. And you know the standard uh, uh, kind of joke, right, is that uh, practitioners consider me a theorist and, and basically theorists consider me a sellout. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, nobody considers me a practitioner, but that's okay. Um, but, uh, but let's actually define terms a little bit. Actually, Mihir Bellari gave a really nice talk uh, here at Crypto in 2014, also talking about, among other things, uh, theory and practice from his point of view. And he actually had a nice taxonomy of what exactly it means for something to be practical. And he gave uh, basically four criteria that you can use, perhaps, to evaluate whether some technology was practical or not. And he didn't actually uh, order them. He actually claimed that there was a, a connect, you know, they were not strictly ordered. But, but in any event, I, I put them in this order. Uh, you, can, you can talk about whether something uh, can be implemented. You can talk about whether that implementation uh, is efficient. And maybe that's the theorist's point of view of what uh, practice means. Uh, you can also ask whether a given technology uh, is worth money to somebody. Will somebody pay for it? Will somebody pay to implement it? Uh, and of course, whether or not it has utility. Uh, I would add to this list uh, a little bit. Um, you can also ask whether things are either standardized or perhaps in the process of being standardized or being thought about as being standardized. That uh, is a useful indication of whether or not people believe that something has practical utility. And then, of course, you can, you can also ask whether something is actually used. Uh, 
Right, it's interesting because I think there are examples uh, of things that are used that have no utility and there are things that have utility but are not used. So it's not the, the case that they, uh, that they are equivalent. And, um, you know, if this were maybe a different kind of talk, I would focus on the fact that nowadays secure computation uh, is uh, worth money because uh, you can look at different companies uh, and, and funding agencies who are investing in this technology. Uh, and I would claim that it also has utility, and there are actually examples here uh, of people using this for various things in the real world, even though it hasn't yet seen uh, widespread deployment. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focusing more on uh, implementations and the efficiency uh, of those implementations. Uh, as far as defining theory, um, it, it turns out it's actually not quite clear how to define it. Uh, you can think perhaps about defining theory in terms of definitions and proofs, but I think actually to the theory community's credit, uh, you know, that focus on definitions and proofs might have been enough to characterize theory uh, in the 80s and the early 90s, but by now they've really permeated uh, much of crypto. Um, you can talk about reliance on mathematical techniques, but that also really characterizes most of the work that cryptographers, that everybody in this room does, and so it doesn't really quite pin down uh, what exactly separates theory from more practical aspects of cryptography. Um, I found this actually in the uh, manifesto of TCC. Uh, I read, how do they define themselves as the theory community? And what they uh, say there, among other things, I, I distilled it to these two, is that they focus on the study of paradigms and techniques and formulating new problems. Uh, or ultimately, you can take this as basically working on problems without caring whether or not they're practical. Uh, which, which uh, is not necessarily uh, a, a negative, um, because what, one thing I, I have found is really there's been an amazing, um, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how actually effective theory has been for practice, really perhaps unreasonably so. And, and I, you know, consider myself uh, a, a cynic in this regard. I, you know, sometimes I see work and I think, oh, you know, that has no hope of ever being practical. Why are people working on that problem? But time and again, uh, I've been proven wrong. And I think secure computation is a great example of this. Uh, the early work in the 80s and the 90s, uh, building these protocols, showing feasibility results, building up definitions and foundations. Uh, and now we see this transitioning into practice. Um, but there are many other examples, actually, and I'll, I'll just list a couple, and, and, I'll, and I'll mention the first one in particular. The first one, I think, is a fantastic example, right? You have these uh, verifiable random functions, uh, also known as unique signatures, that were introduced in 1999. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful idea, but it doesn't seem to have any, you know, potential practical use. And now you see, what is it, uh, 20 years later, roughly, uh, you see that these are a fundamental building block for uh, proof-of-stake blockchain protocols. It's really unbelievable, right? I, I mean, who would have thought that you would come around and have this kind of an application? Um, but I want to also highlight the other side, which I think many of us in the theory community uh, often disregard, is that the, um, the practice or the um, deployment or the usage of different technologies can also be interesting from a theoretical point of view because it can raise all sorts of interesting theoretical questions. And in this talk in particular, I'm going to focus on two questions that arose from looking more carefully at implementations and, and deployments, I guess, of uh, secure computation. Uh, looking, first of all, at how hash functions can be, uh, are, are implemented or how they're instantiated in existing MPC implementations and how they should be instantiated in implementations. Uh, and also looking at the concrete security uh, of secure computation. And that actually connects to the first bullet uh, because that turns out to be dependent on how exactly the hash functions are instantiated. And both of these results that I'm going to talk about uh, really rely on insights from the symmetric key world. And this is the connection to symmetric key cryptography that I talked about uh, a couple of slides ago. And, and you know, I, I felt it particularly apropos here to uh, include a quote from Nigel uh, from his talk here. Uh, he said it as part of his talk that you should always pay attention to all talks. And I think this is great advice, actually, right? It's uh, because you never know when the next idea or where the next idea will come from. Uh, if you stay isolated and only uh, attend one kind of talk, you're missing out on ideas from other, from other people, other communities uh, that can potentially be beneficial to you. So I think it's useful, uh, good advice. So I wanted to give a, um, a little bit of MPC background. I don't know, actually, well, I don't expect that, that most of the audience uh, are experts in secure computation, and I wanted to give kind of enough information that, first of all, you would get something out of the talk, and second of all, you'll be able to follow uh, the second half of the talk. So I'm going to talk about uh, secure two-party computation in particular. Uh, it's just cleaner, and it's, a, um, uh, it's much easier to explain 
uh, for one thing, and, it'll, and, it, and it kind of uh, is enough to describe all the results I'm going to tell you about. So in the setting of secure two-party computation, we have two parties uh, with inputs x and y. And they want to jointly compute some function f uh, of, their, uh, of their mutual inputs. They want to compute the result fxy. And they would like to do this while maintaining various security properties, right? The one we think about uh, the most is privacy, right? That they should be able to get the result fxy without either side revealing their input to the other side. And also, they may be concerned about other properties, for example, correctness, uh, i.e., knowing that the result they compute corresponds to some valid input uh, of each of the parties. Uh, you can consider both the semi-honest setting uh, and the malicious setting. In the semi-honest setting, the idea is that both parties are running the protocol as prescribed, and they're only potentially trying to learn uh, uh, disallowed information from the protocol execution. And in the malicious setting, uh, the parties can behave, or the, or the corrupted party, rather, can behave arbitrarily. And I'm going to focus most of the time in this talk on the, uh, the semi-honest setting. Uh, it turns out that, that semi-honest two-party computation, I, I think, is at this point relatively simple to describe. Uh, I've, I've described this in, in like an hour, well, something like this in an hour-long talk to undergraduates. I, I can't you know, claim to know how much they understood, but, but I think you can, it, it's nicely uh, encapsulated now. Um, uh, it relies essentially on two primitives, um, oblivious transfer and circuit garbling. Uh, and by the way, those are both also wonderful examples of theory uh, impacting practice many years later, right? When, when oblivious transfer was introduced in 1981, I don't think uh, Rabin had, uh, had the idea in his mind, perhaps, that it would develop to the point where it, where it did today. Um, so oblivious transfer is, uh, in, in, the, in the version I'll talk about here, uh, has a sender and receiver. The sender has two inputs. Let's think of them as strings here, uh, x0 and x1. Uh, the receiver on the right-hand side has a selector bit b. And we can uh, define what we want by uh, defining what we would want in an ideal world where the parties had a trusted, uh, incorruptible third party to rely on. Uh, I have to say, whenever I give a talk like this, that it becomes harder and harder to find something that people might view as an incorruptible, trusted party. But let's take the IACR as, uh, as an example. <laughs> um, so what, what's, the, uh, what's the ideal functionality going to do? It's going to accept the inputs from both parties. It's going to accept x0 and x1 from the sender and the bit b from the receiver. And then it will return only the string selected, right, the string x sub b, to the receiver. And so the receiver learns nothing about the other string, and the sender learns nothing about the selector bit of the receiver. Great. Uh, circuit garbling is a little bit more complicated. Um, this was introduced by Yao in 1986. The idea here is that we, uh, there's going to be one party, the so-called uh, circuit garbler, who uh, for every uh, gate in some circuit and for every wire going in and out of that gate, will choose two strings to label each wire. Uh, so here I've just shown A0, A1 on the top wire, and then B0, B1, and then C0, C1 on the output wire. And the, those strings will correspond to each of the possible underlying bits on that wire. So say A0 corresponds to the bit 0 on that uh, particular wire. And then what you want to ensure, and, and you can then hook these up, right? You can connect that output wire to another gate and continue this as long as you like. And if you just want to ensure correctness, you want to ensure that somebody can now use this to evaluate the circuit, what you, what you need to do is you need to, first of all, ensure that the evaluator, the other party, is going to learn one label on each input wire of the circuit. Okay, so they're going to learn either, say, A0 or A1, if that's an input wire of the circuit. And then you need to ensure um, that you can maintain the following invariant, that every time you're at a gate, at a garbled gate, and you have one label on each of the two input wires to that gate, say A sub R and B sub S, you can somehow or another compute the string corresponding to the correct bit on the output wire. So in this case, we're talking about an AND gate. You should be able to compute from AR and BS the string C of, of the bit R and S. And if you can do that, then you can go from the input wires down to the output wires. You can gradually learn uh, every uh, one, one label, one string on every wire all the way till the output wire. And then the garbler can also provide some kind of a translation table telling you which actual bit the strings on the output wires correspond to. From the point of security, uh, what we need to do is we need to ensure, first of all, that uh, when the evaluator learns a label on some wire, it shouldn't reveal what the underlying bit on that wire is. Right? So if the, if, the, uh, if, if the A wire, for example, corresponds to an input of the garbler, then when the garbler gives A0 to the evaluator, the evaluator shouldn't learn that that corresponds to the zero bit. Otherwise, it would leak the bit of their input. 
And you also need to ensure that the evaluator will only ever be able to learn uh, one label or one string per wire, because uh, if it can learn both, then it can actually, from that, deduce potentially uh, what bit each string corresponds to. And this sounds perhaps very complicated, but it turns out to be very easy to implement, at least in, in, in some naive way. Uh, you can simply uh, have this idea of a garbled table uh, corresponding to every gate, where uh, you simply include encryptions of the appropriate output wire uh, under keys corresponding to the appropriate input wires. So for example, uh, let's look here. You see that there's only one encryption of the string C1. And that's going to correspond to something that can be decrypted only if the evaluator has the uh, strings corresponding to the one inputs on both of the input wires. Right? So only if they have A1 and B1 do they recover C1. In any other case, they're going to recover C0. Great. And we can now couple these together and build a semi-honest uh, two-PC protocol. So let's uh, consider the case where x and y bits for simplicity. Uh, what P1 will do is it will garble that gate. Uh, it will then send that garbled gate over to the other side. Uh, and now it has to ensure that the other side, P2, is going to learn exactly one string on each input wire. So if A corresponds to P1's input, then what it will do is it will simply send the string corresponding to its input bit x. So it will send AX. Uh, and now it has to also make sure that P2 can learn the string on the B wire corresponding to P2's input. Well, what can they use to do that? They can use oblivious transfer, right? P2 can use the selector bit Y. Uh, the strings that P1 will input are exactly the strings B0 and B1. P2 will learn only the string B sub Y. And then it can go ahead and from that and from the garbled gate compute the string corresponding to X and Y, which it can then decode and recover the actual output bit X and Y. Okay, so quite uh, simple and clean. Now, let's look a little bit at some interplay here between theory and practice, uh, in particular through the lens of symmetric key cryptography. And the main takeaway point uh, of this part of the talk is that uh, as secure computation moves from theory to practice, uh, there's a real need to understand the real world security, not just of abstract protocols as written in a paper, but of the actual implementations themselves. And in particular, this is not really a, a surprise to anybody perhaps who's ever implemented anything or looked at implementations, is that there's very often a, a gap between protocols in theory or protocols as written in a paper or as not written in the paper uh, and in practice, right? So for example, there are very, very often uh, lots of low-level details that are omitted, uh, sometimes because they're assumed to be folklore or they're assumed to be obvious, but then you sit down and somebody's going to implement it and they may miss out on those subtle points. There are often implementation level details that are unspecified that are left up to the programmer. Uh, there are various performance optimizations that people may uh, employ during the implementation phase. And what you get in the end is that you implemented something that was close to the protocol as specified in the paper. And the protocol in the paper may even have been proven secure under some assumptions. But you're missing now an end-to-end -end security proof for the protocol as implemented. And if we're going to move toward greater deployment of secure computation uh, or toward standardization of secure computation, uh, it's going to be critical to address this gap. Um, if you look at efficient implementations of uh, semi-honest secure two-party computation, the efficiency improvements over the last, you know, you can, you can count since Yao or you can look at the last 10 years, uh, they've been driven by improvements in the underlying building blocks. Uh, the particular ones I want to highlight are uh, OT extension. Uh, I'll talk about it more in a few, uh, in a few slides. Uh, and also improved garbling schemes. There have been many different optimizations that people have come up with for the garbling step. And all of these protocols, all of these improvements, both the OT extension and the various improvements to garbling schemes, uh, all ultimately rely on some hash function H. This is basically how they're written in the paper. And uh, sometimes the protocol is proven secure based on certain assumptions about the hash function. Uh, other times the protocol may be proven secure when the hash function H is modeled as a random oracle. But the question remains, perhaps, well, that's good, but how then should we implement the protocol? And, when we, and in particular, when we implement the protocol, how should we instantiate this hash function H? And when we choose to instantiate that hash function in a particular way, is that implementation secure? Uh, and then you can ask also, well, even if that's secure, are there maybe better ways that you can go about uh, doing that? 
And of course, these kind of questions are not specific to secure computation. The difficulties of instantiating uh, a random oracle uh, are, are kind of well known. Um, I don't think they've really been looked at uh, extensively in the context of secure computation before. Now, many of you may be sitting there thinking, well, what's the problem, right? Uh, so the natural thing to say is, well, look, we know how to instantiate a hash function. We'll just, we're just going to use SHA, OK? So first of all, you have to be a little bit careful, right? I mean, SHA2 is not indifferentiable from a random oracle. You can patch it so that it is. That's fine. That, that's great. Uh, the real problem is that there's a preference for using something other than SHA in these uh, most efficient protocol implementations. And it, specifically, there's a preference for using a fixed key AES. This is actually inspired by some work uh, by Bellari et al. in 2013, uh, who showed basically that you can, in the context of garbling specifically, that you can get uh, tremendous efficiency improvements by relying on fixed key AES rather than a cryptographic hash function like SHA. And the reasons for that are, first of all, you can exploit uh, hardware support for AES. Uh, you can also avoid the cost of key scheduling if you fix the key, right? So if you, uh, I'll talk about this more in the next slide. But basically, if you're not rekeying, the, the rekeying operation in AES uh, adds a significant overhead to the total computational cost. And if you look at the numbers, you see that the hash functions, if you just were going to use an off-the-shelf cryptographic hash function like SHA-2 or SHA-3, they're basically 15 to 50 times slower than using fixed key AES. So yes, you can use uh, SHA, but then you're going to be paying a significant performance penalty. Uh, it's a good point for a digression about fixed key AES and the random permutation model, which I'll be talking about. Um, so if we fix some key K, and for now I don't really care how the key is chosen, uh, we can consider the fixed permutation that I'll call pi, which is just the AES block cipher with that key hard-coded. Right? This is now giving us a, a fixed permutation uh, on 128-bit strings. And what is uh, sometimes done, and what we're going to do in this talk, is um, to model that permutation pi as a random permutation. And we're going to work in the so-called random permutation model, which is really completely analogous to the random oracle model. The, really, the difference is that in the random oracle model, you're given access to a random function. Here, you're going to be given access to a random permutation, as well as the inverse of that permutation. So of course, anybody who has the key k can compute AES inverse, so we have to allow the attacker to compute the inverse as well. And uh, even though this may seem, uh, maybe it is even a strong assumption, uh, I'll just point out that it's weaker than modeling AES as an ideal cipher. Um, there may be other reasons to believe that AES may not act as an ideal cipher, but modeling block ciphers in general as ideal ciphers is also a common approach that people take when trying to prove security of constructions uh, based on block ciphers. So coming back to the problem of instantiating hash functions, uh, many people in the audience may say, well, you know, we still don't have a problem because what we can do is simply construct a random oracle from a random permutation, right? And that gives us our way to instantiate the hash function H. And it is true that there are some constructions uh, of a random oracle from a random permutation. Uh, we discussed them in the paper. Uh, the, the, the short answer is that they have uh, drawbacks in efficiency uh, or concrete security or have difficulty handling uh, long inputs. And I would say, actually, it's a good open question uh, to come up with a suitable uh, way to instantiate a random oracle from a random permutation, where suitable here just means for the context of, uh, of the specific applications to secure computation that I'm focusing on. So in this talk, right, I'm going to talk, like I said, about how to hash, how to instantiate these hash functions and implementations. Uh, I'll just mention briefly about some empirical study of existing implementations and then talk about uh, instantiating hash functions securely uh, in this talk, I'll focus on the particular case of OT extension. Uh, in the paper, we talk about garbling and some other applications. And then I'm going to talk about instantiating a hash function while ensuring good concrete security. Uh, here, I'm going to focus on the case of garbling. And both of these uh, are based on uh, joint work with Chun Guo, uh, Xiao Wang, and Yu Yu, uh, combining expertise from the symmetric key world and the, uh, and the protocol world. Okay, so let me talk first about uh, secure hashing from fixed key AES in the context of oblivious transfer. So, oops. so I, I, taught, I mentioned OT extension before. I didn't explain what it was. Uh, OT extension is basically a very powerful technique for converting uh, a small number of what are called base OTs. So think about, say, 128 uh, uh, base OTs. And then taking those and converting them into essentially an unlimited number uh, of OTs. 
And this is fantastic because it turns out that the base OTs that you uh, implement require public key cryptography. But the additional OTs that you can then uh, uh, obtain from those base OTs rely on symmetric key cryptography only. So this essentially means that if you want to do a million uh, oblivious transfers, you're paying the cost of 128 uh, public key base OTs. And then all the remaining OTs are going to only be uh, relying on symmetric key operations. It has a huge performance impact in practice. And the existing paradigm for uh, efficient OT extension works a little bit differently from what I've been describing. Uh, essentially, what it does is it relies on a protocol for what I'll call random OT. And I'll show uh, exactly what that is on the next slide. And then you basically take what you get from the random OT, and you bootstrap that in some way to obtain the, the uh, one out of two OT that you actually want. So let me show what that looks like. So here we have uh, a party on the left, a sender, but they now have actually multiple pairs of inputs. And the party on the right has multiple uh, selection bits. Think of them as a vector, if you like. Uh, they're going to rely on this random OT functionality that I talked about. Uh, there are some um, details here that I'm uh, eliding. But essentially, the idea is that the uh, receiver will input its selection bits. Uh, and then what will happen is that the random OT functionality is going to pick a bunch of random values that satisfy certain constraints. And in particular, what it will do is it will choose uh, a random shift uh, delta and a bunch of random strings uh, xi and give those to the, uh, to the sender. And the receiver will obtain uh, as its values yi the random strings xi xored with uh, bi times delta. Okay, so either the shift is applied or not, depending on whether uh, bi is equal to 0 or 1. And now, of course, the sender wants to transmit one of its actual strings. So what it will do is it will compute these masked values uh, that I've called m prime i sub b that are computed by masking its actual strings mib with the result of evaluating a hash function on uh, xi xored with b delta for both values of b. Okay, so the uh, the sender has delta, the sender has xi. It can, it can compute both options, you know, both with and without the shift, uh, use that as a mask, and then uh, send the masked values over to the other party. That party can then strip off exactly one mask per pair and recover uh, exactly one of, the, one of the two strings for every one of these pairs here. And the important thing to focus on here is the masking that's being applied which, as I said, is the result of computing a hash on these various uh, values here, twice times L values if they're L pairs here. So you can prove that this protocol is secure, even for malicious uh, attackers, if H is modeled as a random oracle. And I'll just mention, uh, since it'll come up later, that if you're only concerned about semi-honest attackers, then it, you can actually omit uh, the, the second argument here, the, the I that I had, and you can simply send uh, or use that as a mask. But as I said before, this leaves open the question of how exactly H should be implemented. And when we went to look at existing implementations uh, of this, uh, this uh, OT extension protocol, we observed that in many of the current uh, libraries, the hash function H is, as I said before, actually implemented using fixed key AES. So how did people choose to implement it? Well, it basically, uh, they made it up as they went along, I guess what one could say. Uh, you see different types of implementations, different types of, um, uh, of choices here. This actually just shows what kind of uh, security the implementation was targeting. And the problem in the end with all of this is that it turns out these are all insecure, at least insecure as realizations of the OT extension functionality. Uh, let me actually give a, a, a simple example. So uh, consider the case where um, you implement, you instantiate h of x. Maybe, maybe I should have left out the i here. Uh, h of x equals pi of x. Uh, in the semi-honest setting, if h were a random oracle, that would be fine. And assume, for example, that the receiver happens to know two of the messages uh, in one particular index. So it knows m10 and m11. Well, then from the two masked messages, the receiver can actually compute pi of a1 and pi of a1 xor delta. Uh, and since pi is invertible, this allows recovery of delta. Okay? And once it recovers delta, it can then learn everything. 
Now, that's an attack on the OT protocol. Uh, it turns out that in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, you can actually uh, extend that to an attack on the full, uh, full 2PC protocol. So we thought about you know, what would be a principled way forward. Well, what we can do is we can try to define security properties for this hash function h that would, say, be weaker than uh, asking for indifferentiability from a random oracle. Uh, in particular, we focus here on the security property that we call uh, tweakable correlation robustness that I'll define on another slide. And then prove that the OT extension protocol is secure when H satisfies those properties. So you don't actually require H to be a random oracle. It's enough for it to satisfy this uh, more limited set of properties. And then show how to provably realize those properties from a fixed key cipher you know, modeled as a random permutation pi. So the notion of correlation robustness was actually introduced in the context of the uh, original OT extension protocol. Our, our definition is not exactly equivalent to theirs, but it's certainly inspired by it. And without giving the, the um, you know, longer formal definition, I'll just say that a hash function h we define to be correlation robust if the keyed function defined in this way is a pseudorandom function. So basically what you're doing is you're just using the key as a shift uh, on the input. And then we define this stronger notion of a tweakable uh, correlation robust hash function uh, inspired by tweakable block ciphers in that line of work. Uh, if you just allow the secondary input, this tweak, which is not masked at all. And we still require that f be a pseudorandom function in that case. And it's not too hard to show that the OT extension protocol uh, on the previous slide uh, remains secure in the semi honest setting if H is correlation robust and is secure in the malicious setting if your hash function is tweakable correlation robust. So how can you then construct a, cor a correlation robust hash function? So uh, it turns out that we can uh, come up with this construction. Uh, I've called it uh, here MMO prime because it looks very similar uh, for people who are familiar with the Matthias uh, Mayer OCs, a construction of a hash function from a block cipher. This is very similar to what they do. Uh, I'll just point out that it's not equivalent because in that case, they're actually trying to get compression. Uh, here, we're not looking for compression. So we just have a single input x coming in and a single uh, uh, input going out. There's no compression going on here. For the case of the tweakable correlation robust, it's actually uh, more difficult. And the difficulty really comes in in terms of where to, where to fit in this tweak. Uh, and this is, you know, part of the challenge here is what I mentioned earlier that, like I said, there's known work on constructing things that are indifferentiable from a random oracle from, uh, from a, uh, a random permutation, but they will, will not always be able to handle an input that's uh, of length twice the block size. Uh, but this construction here that we call a tweakable MMO, um, uh, TMMO, is the construction we have. And what we're able to show is that if you model this permutation pi as a random permutation, then the MMO prime construction of the hash function is correlation robust, and TMMO is tweakable correlation robust. Uh, both of these uh, rely on the H coefficient technique. I mentioned that uh, because it's another really beautiful technique uh, that arose from the symmetric key world that I don't know if, if people perhaps who don't work in that field are familiar with. It's really uh, quite beautiful. Uh, and should be perhaps more widely known. And so overall, we obtain uh, an OT extension protocol, uh, or OT extension protocols, one in the semi-honest setting, one in the malicious setting, that have end-to-end uh, -end security proofs based on fixed key AES uh, modeled as a random permutation. And what I'm showing here is just uh, the efficiency of the resulting construction so I mentioned in particular at the beginning that if you wanted to, you could implement the hash function in those protocols uh, with, uh, uh, with SHA, SHA-3 or SHA-256. Uh, but if you do that, you're going to pay a significant performance penalty. Um, this shows what the, uh, uh, the performance essentially of AES with and without key scheduling. Uh, those are shaded because those actually would not give you a secure instantiation of the hash function. But you can see here that our resulting constructions uh, the MMO prime and the TMMO uh, are, you know, in the case of MMO prime, essentially paying the cost of a single fixed key AES evaluation. Uh, in the case of TMMO, uh, we're paying two, co two uh, calls to the permutation, essentially, which is why it's essentially twice uh, of what you pay for fixed key AES. So what I wanted to look at next was uh, some work on the concrete security of uh, the circuit garblings. 
Uh, this is kind of well known, uh, right? We have two, two notions of security that we often look at in cryptography, uh, asymptotic security and concrete security, where asymptotic security in a nutshell basically claims that something is secure if no polynomial time attacker can break the scheme with better than negligible probability. Whereas in the case of concrete security, what we're interested in is explicitly bounding the success probability of an adversary in terms of the resources that they have available, and in particular, uh, in terms of the complexity of the attack or the running time, for example. And uh, surprisingly, I would say there's been little focus on concrete security in the context of secure uh, computation. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's no focus. There are certainly papers uh, that will give a concrete security bound, but it hasn't received the amount of attention, I would say, as concrete security in the context of signature schemes, for example. And I wanted to look at concrete security, in particular in the context of some of the uh, more recent and more highly optimized uh, circuit garbling schemes. And so for that, I need to introduce, actually, two of the optimizations that are now uh, commonly used. So I talked earlier about a very simple garbling technique um, where you associate, I didn't say it at the time, but I, I was perhaps thinking in terms of letting A0 and A1 uh, be, uh, be independent random strings. Uh, and then you compute the garble table in this way. It ends up having four ciphertexts and doing uh, potentially eight encryptions if you do this naively. And the free XOR and the half gates optimization are two different ways people have come up with in order to um, uh, improve the communication complexity and also computational complexity of circuit garbling. So the free XOR technique is actually uh, simple to describe. Uh, the basic idea is rather than choosing the two strings associated with any given wire uh, independently at random, we're going to maintain them, or we're, we're going to have them be correlated through a global random shift R. So you see here that we are going to choose, the garble will choose a random string uh, for each wire that will represent, say, the zero wire. And then the one wire on every, or the one label on every wire will just be the zero label shifted by the same shift R. And this is useful because then, as the name suggests, it allows you actually to support XOR gates in your circuit without paying any computational cost at all. So essentially, they become free, and the only cost in your circuit is handling uh, AND gates and OR gates. The second optimization uh, is a very clever uh, optimization that allows you to reduce the communication complexity of a garbled table. So as I said, here on the left, we have essentially four uh, different ciphertexts. So if, you're, uh, if your labels are kappa bits long, you're paying uh, roughly essentially four kappa here. Um, the half gates protocol replaces that with only what I'll call two ciphertexts. And I'm not going to go through the details of how it works or prove correctness. It's quite, uh, quite involved. What I wanted to just highlight here is something we're going to focus in on on the next slide, is that one of the values that's being sent is this value that here I call T1. Okay, and I claim, uh, again, without going through the details, that this will preserve the property I talked about earlier, namely that if the evaluator has one of the two uh, labels on each of the input wires of a gate, they can then successfully compute the corresponding output wire on that gate. And moreover, what's nice about the half case protocol is that it's uh, com compatible with the free XOR optimization. And, and I've indicated that here, actually, uh, that you have the label A1, for example, is actually still A0 XOR with R, as it is in the free XOR optimization. And it's natural to ask, well, what's the concrete security of uh, garbling in this way? Uh, R is essentially a uniform k-bit value. Uh, it may actually be k minus 1 bits, but we can ignore that for now. Uh, you want to actually make kappa as small as possible, because the communication complexity is going to be exactly twice kappa. Okay, so if you're satisfied with, say, 80-bit security, you'd prefer to set kappa equal 80 and then send only 160 bits per garbled gate. And you can show, actually, that if you model the hash function h that you use to compute uh, the, those, those uh, two ciphertexts in the new garbling scheme, that this actually is, uh, kappa, gives, you, gives you kappa bit security. And many papers uh, and implementations uh, set kappa equals 80. Um, this is maybe targeting one of the NIST recommended security levels, and obviously people are trying to make their, 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 the results in their paper look as good as possible, so they choose kappa to be the, the smallest reasonable value, which is uh, 80. And we can again ask, well, those results are fine if uh, we're willing to model H as a random oracle and use something like SHA, 
But if you look, in fact, at how H is implemented, uh, it's again typically based on fixed key AES. Uh, and one common choice is this um, uh, essentially computing H of XI as uh, MMO, I guess it should be MMO prime, uh, of 2x XOR I. And this 2 here may look odd. Maybe we'll come back to that later and say why people did that. But, but this is a, one popular choice. And if you look at this, you can see that clearly it's no longer indifferentiable from a random oracle. And so essentially, this leaves a gap between uh, what we're able to prove and, and what's, pro uh, you know, what, what's proved for the implementation and what's proved in the paper. And in particular, leaves open what the concrete security of this choice might be. And it turns out that when H is implemented in this way, uh, there's an attack that has complexity 2 to the kappa divided by C, where C is the number of gates that you're garbling. So what that means is that if you're garbling 1 billion gates, which is now a, a popular uh, number to target, um, based on a paper, I don't know, five, six years ago, if you garble 1 billion gates with kappa equals 80, then you can break the scheme uh, in essentially time 2 to the 50. And the attack is really bad, because when you uh, implement the attack successfully, it allows the attacker to recover R. And once you recover R, you can reveal everything. So you basically learn, the, the, you learn, you learn all the inputs. And the attack also extends to the multi-instance or multi-user setting, where either the same user is garbling uh, many different times, or you have different users who are garbling, and the attacker succeeds if they're able to attack any one of them. This is something also that's gotten a lot of attention recently in the context of symmetric key cryptography and hasn't really seen uh, perhaps a lot of attention in the context of secure computation. And so here's just kind of some numbers I, I played around with. If you garble a billion gates every day for a year uh, using kappa equals 80, then you can break one of those instances uh, with, uh, in, in time about 2 to the 42. So let me try to describe the main ideas behind the attack. Um, so the evaluator is going to be learning one of the labels on every wire. So it's learning, in particular, one value A star in this set, which is either A0 or A0 XOR R. Uh, the evaluator doesn't know which, which is the case. But it also learns this value T1. That was one of the values that's being sent as part of the half-gate scheme. And it learns that value T1 for each of C different gates if C different gates are being garbled. The evaluator or the attacker can then uh, compute, it can hash the value A star that it received, uh, it can XOR that with T1 and obtain this value here. Whoops. And the observation is that this value PA, which I didn't actually define, uh, it's a bit that in the construction of the half gates protocol is zero with probability half. Okay, it's just a random bit. And so what that means is that the evaluator has an expectation, right, C over two values uh, of the following form that I put in this list L. Uh, it has basically uh, MMO applied to two A star J XOR R XOR J. And here, actually, I'm just instantiating the hash function H with that MMO construction from the previous slide. So now what the attacker can do is just evaluate this MMO hash function on its own on a bunch of random values, W1 through WQ, until it finds an evaluation that lands in that list. Okay, this is going to occur with probability Q times C divided by 2 to the kappa. And then with constant probability, it will hold that the uh, WI is equal to the input to, to the MMO. Uh, and from there, you can solve for R, uh, and then you're done. Okay. So uh, again, with kappa equals 80 and garbling 1 billion gates, it turns out you can actually implement this attack for about $1,000 in a few weeks uh, in the cloud. So if we're trying to get better concrete security for garbling, um, what we need is to look at the properties we require of the underlying hash function. And it turns out that what you need for garbling is a stronger notion of correlation robustness that we call uh, tweakable circular correlation robustness. Actually, the notion of circular correlation robustness was a notion that um, uh, myself and some colleagues introduced in 2012. Um, here we define a tweakable notion uh, of, that, uh, of that definition. And moreover, if we want good concrete security, then we're going to want a construction of a TCCR hash function that, that itself has good concrete security. And we show that this uh, uh, construction that we call MMO star uh, is, uh, is going to be such a construction.
Uh, I want to point out a couple of things here. So first of all, right, we have two inputs. We have the input and then this, uh, this index or this nonce. Um, we also here are moving away from the random permutation model. Uh, this represents actually now AES itself or some block cipher. Uh, and this represents the key, whereas this left input here represents the input. So we're no longer working in the random permutation model. Now we're working in the uh, ideal cipher model. Uh, this permutation here or this function sigma uh, I'll talk about it on the next slide, but it's basically going to need some combinatorial properties in order to prove the construction secure. And in particular, what we're going to require is that sigma b was called a linear orthomorphism. Uh, we define, for any given sigma, we can define this function sigma prime to be sigma x xor x. And then we'll say that sigma is an orthomorphism if both sigma and sigma prime are permutations. And then sigma is linear if the standard property holds. Uh, and these functions turn out to have received a lot of attention in the symmetric key literature. And they've also been imported to some extent into uh, secure computation. In particular, the, uh, the multiplying by two that I showed earlier, I think, uh, arises from the fact that this is a, uh, is a linear orthomorphism. It was suggested um, in the, uh, I believe, in the Just Garble paper. We find actually a, a different construction is, uh, is actually much more efficient, can be implemented in, in a very small number of instructions, uh, and is better than, doing, than paying the cost of a field multiplication. So the theorem then is that if sigma is a linear orthomorphism, and if we model the block cipher f as an ideal cipher, then um, MMO star is a tweakable circular correlation robust, and moreover, it has a kappa bit security. So this is true only in the case where every tweak, the second input i, is used once. Uh, and that will be the case when we apply it to the context of garbling, when we apply it to the context of secure uh, computation. So overall, then, uh, we obtain a garbling scheme with the same communication complexity as free XOR plus half gates, uh, but with a tight security reduction based on AES modeled as an ideal cipher. And I was talking earlier about how, in general, people like to avoid the, the, um, uh, the, the paying the cost of rekeying for AES. So it's true that you do pay some penalty for that. Uh, thankfully, there's been, been some other work, also in the context of secure computation, showing that you can at least do a little bit better, and the cost of rekeying is not as bad as you might expect. Uh, I'll just mention also that we can extend these results to obtain tighter security also for garbling, uh, even in the multi-instance setting. So let me just uh, conclude with a couple of thoughts, and then we'll have time for some questions. So I think there's been a lot of work on secure computation in the last 30 years. And of course, most of the uh, initial work in that field was focusing on the theory of secure computation, focusing on definitions, focusing on feasibility results, focusing on different models. And in the last 15 years, uh, say since the uh, Fair Play paper, uh, there's been a, an increased focus on implementing secure computation and in improving the practical efficiency of secure computation protocols. And I would say this has been mainly theory uh, driving the practice, with, of course, the theory being motivated by real-world efficiency, but it's really been more theoretical uh, work that then turns out to, be, to lead to these efficiency improvements. And perhaps in the next 15 years, we'll see a little bit of a flip uh, and see more uh, practical issues driving the theory. Uh, and I think that will especially be the case as not only there are more uh, secure computation libraries out there that people are experimenting with, but when there start to be deployments of secure computation in real world use cases, and as companies are beginning to deploy and sell these things uh, in the real world, that I think will bring up many interesting questions that will then need uh, new theory to address. And I think these kind of things are very important to think about as we perhaps move toward developing standards for things like zero knowledge or secure computation. So I just thought I would list maybe a couple of open directions. Uh, I put a question mark there because I'm sure, I, actually I know that many of these are uh, addressed at least in part by various papers. Uh, I would say there's still more work to be done in those directions though. Uh, so I think first of all, maybe an increased attention to concrete security uh, is called for. And in particular, I'm not aware uh, of any composition theorem that actually deals with concrete security. And if you start thinking about it, you realize that there are good reasons for that because it's not as trivial as you might think. Uh, you can even start thinking about what, what a, a version of universal composability would look like with a concrete security treatment. Uh, 
Um, a better understanding of ideal primitives and protocols. Uh, right here, I talked about two uh, lines of work using the random permutation model or the ideal cipher model. Uh, there's lots of protocols developed in the random oracle model. I, I would say, uh, maybe, it's my, maybe it's my own take on things, I think we still don't have a full understanding of what exactly, um, uh, what sort of composition results hold when we talk about composing protocols that rely on these ideal primitives. And there are very often cases where things don't satisfy the properties you might expect by naively applying uh, existing composition theorems that mainly talk about composition in the absence of these ideal primitives. Certainly that's true in the standalone setting. Uh, what about post-quantum MPC? Uh, as far as I can tell, there's been um, uh, you know, less than five papers uh, looking at constructions of post-quantum oblivious transfer. But this is something that uh, people are paying a lot of attention to in the public key world in general, in the context of encryption and signatures. And we need to start looking at that in the context of things like oblivious transfer as well. And we can also ask about the concrete security of these various symmetric key components of the protocols uh, against quantum attackers. I think also there's a lot of work to be done on mapping some of our theoretical models to the way things actually work in practice. Uh, just, just as, you know, some examples, right? I mean, we, we assume that there's some fixed set of parties, right? There's n parties and they all agree at t equals zero to start running the protocol, but how, how is that actually going to work in the real world, right? Uh, if you think about applications of this to something like voting, you realize that that model doesn't translate very well to that kind of a setting. Um, you can talk about session IDs. This is something that's needed for composition, for, for universal composability, and for other reasons. Um, and I think generally people ignore that when they implement their protocols. Um, and it's, you know, they ignore it maybe for good reason because it's not so, always so simple to uh, establish agreement on those session IDs and it can add some complexity to the protocol. Uh, looking at how these various setups actually would be implemented and used in practice. Uh, I think considering more complex trust models, right? So again, this is something that goes back uh, decades. People have looked at generalized adversary models. But if you look at the work on efficient, secure computation, people have generally uh, stayed with the more classical threshold adversary. Uh, but you can, you, it's also interesting to look um, uh, for, for optimized protocols that are secure in these more complex settings. Um, another thing that's interesting to me recently is a more, more accurate modeling of the network. Uh, we have basically two models, right? A synchronous model and an asynchronous model. And it you know, I, I think neither of those may be a very good model for the way real world communication networks work, especially when you're talking about parties where some of them may be located in, in the same data center, but some of them may be located across the world. Uh, similarly, we always, uh, or we generally think about a complete topology, but in many, um, uh, in many real world applications of secure computation, you, mean, you, you either may not have a complete topology, meaning, meaning links between all pairs of players, or it may be the case that some links are much more expensive to use than others, and so you'd like to minimize the amount of data you send across those links. I think also in a slightly different direction, um, the uh, formal verification of MPC implement implementations is something that's also going to be important as we talk about deploying these things in the real world. Uh, it's very easy to uh, look at a proof in the paper and be convinced that it's correct. Sometimes they turn out to be wrong, maybe just for subtle, subtle errors. Uh, then when you take that protocol from the paper and implement it, it's very easy, maybe as I've shown here, to get some details wrong and then invalidate the end-to-end -end security proof. And I think formal verification can help here, uh, at least even if we can't do an end-to-end -end verification of a full implementation, at least verifying parts of it will give us confidence in, uh, in different parts of the protocol. So uh, with that, I'll conclude. I think we have you know, one to five minutes for questions, depending on how hungry people are. Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions people have. Yes, please, if you have questions, come down the aisle and, uh, and use the microphone. No? And in the meantime, let me ask a question. So, uh, this, um, so from your presentation, it seems that uh, random oracles can be a great way to make things efficient, but in practice, they can be also very error-prone and tricky to use, which also from a practical point of view is not good. Uh, how much would you lose uh, by trying to uh, not use the random oracle model and try to get uh, secure multi-party computation in the standard model, uh, primarily for a usability <coughs> to make it easier to design and program? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, I don't have an answer offhand. It's, a, it's an open question. I, I would say, you know, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a research question, right? So you could look at that garbling, the garbling protocol I showed, and the trivial garbling protocol, for example, can be implemented uh, based on AES, just treating it as a pseudo-random function without making any, any idealized assumptions at all. So that gives you maybe something to compare to. Uh, in general, though, we like to squeeze as much efficiency out as possible, and it seems like you're always going to do better the, more, uh, the stronger assumptions you're willing to make. OK, thank you. Chandri? So has anyone looked at uh, using fixed key AES for work? For proof of work? Um, not that I'm aware of, but it wouldn't surprise me if somebody had. Um, I think, you know, if you're talking about just replacing the hash function used in Bitcoin with AES or something like that, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what the advantage would be because you'd want to keep the work the same, so you'd maybe have to increase the number of AES calls you do to make it consistent. No, it may be because you may not be able to use uh, NVIDIA. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, yeah. So, uh, well, now you have a company. <laughs> I also Pardon? agree with uh, everything you said. You say what? Your reference to, to Nigel. Oh, you agree, agree with everything he said? Or <laughs> no, so one, uh, I agree with your concrete uh, security type approach. One, and about the composition theorem, just a pointer that uh, we got some paper a few years back on resource fairness, where we had to reprove, you know, we have a composition theorem in this. Uh, in so the does it give you clean concrete bounds? Like, like, like uh... well, for resource fairness, but it's an example okay. where you have to go into the concrete aspects. Okay, so that's a good. Uh, Pointer then, thanks. Run. Uh, two comments. First, I uh, also agree with Juan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have now a chain. It's yeah, good. Yeah. Um, but okay, so first, the, just to say that the, in the UC monster, there is also a definition with concrete bounds. So with concrete bounds. Of, yeah, so it's a definition. But, uh, and actually, this, the composition theorem also. There is a is the the, concrete bounds. Uh, is it in the original paper? In the, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever revision, yeah. yeah, yeah. The original <laughs> paper that came yeah. out last year? <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think it's been there for, for a while. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. so, so the, by, by composition, you lose a factor of a number of instances in no, the No, but the difficulty, uh, the no, no, that's, that's yeah. a standard hybrid argument, right? But right. I think the issue is that you have this extra term of the simulator, right? Because you can, you can trade off attacker right. complexity for simulator complexity. Right. No, yeah. so, so the simulator complexity actually remains the same. I mean, it's not uh, affected by that. Oh, I mean, I mean, in, uh, machine. Uh, but, but, but I mean, when you're proving protocols, right, you can have a protocol that's secure against one adversary with this running time of a simulator and get better bounds with a different right. simulator. Right, yeah. But yeah. in terms of the composition theorem, yeah. Yeah. Means, yeah. But then another, another point regarding the, uh, 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 the proof of work and, 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 and AES, so just to say that there is this uh, recent work, right, uh, uh, that we actually show that uh, if you think about correlation tractability of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, fixed key AES, and if you assume, you know, ideal secure, well, not ideal, but you know, uh, exponential security for AES against whatever key dependent messages, then it actually gives uh, some con concrete bounds on the uh, on the on the proof of work and then, uh, 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 amount of work that you need to do. Yeah, so maybe tying so, that back so, to Daniela's question, right, that may be a type of assumption under which, right, assuming, you know, that, that AES is a PRF, but you need this much complexity to attack it, maybe right. a slight weakening of the ideal cipher model that, where you can prove stuff. Yeah, absolutely, and, and it actually, in this case, uh, uh, AES is much better than SHA, because oh, okay. actually the fact that it's, that it's a, you know, it's a permutation or equal input, uh, input equal to the output length, and you think of it as an, and, and as an ideal cipher. Uh, so... Uh, so this particular, it's, uh, it's with, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, and, uh, and Ron Mudbloom and, uh, and, uh, and Leo, yeah, Leo Raisin, yeah, from whatever, your two. Okay, so uh, let's thank Jonathan again.